Welcome to another reaction video. Today, I'm going to be responding and interacting with some comments by Russell Moore on like-mindedness. How, when the Bible tells Christians, the church, to be of one accord and one mind, what is the best way to deal with the political issues surrounding our time of abortion, gay rights, gay marriage, gun control, and I could go on and mm -hmm. list them. Mm -hmm. When you have factions within the church, mm -hmm. and um, what's the best way to deal with those things? Because there's there could be some really, you know, let's not talk politics because we're going to get angry mm -hmm. at each other. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. It, we actually know how to do this, and sometimes we don't think we do, but we actually do. And, and the way that we know how to do this is when it comes to issues of personal morality. The Bible doesn't make this huge distinction that we do between justice uh, and personal morality. We understand when it comes to personal morality, there are certain things that are clearly revealed in Scripture. We speak those things clearly. So if somebody says, you know, I'm really praying about whether or not to leave my wife or some other woman, we don't have to pray about that. We need to say no. It gives me great pleasure to agree with Russell Moore entirely. This is exactly right. You're not going to do that. There are going to be some other issues where there are principles involved, but those principles can be achieved in multiple different ways. So children, uh, parents, raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, somebody comes and says, okay, do we have our children in public school, in private school? Do we homeschool? That's not what we're here to decide. We're here to tell you this is the principle of what it means to be a Christian, and people are going to express that sometimes in differing ways. And then there are going to be other things. If I just interject here, I think that that's a legitimate argument if the end result of those three different ways were all comparable. So, for example, if 95% uh, of the Christian kids who went through government schools come out the other end, robust Christians, if the same thing is true of private school and the same thing is true of homeschool, it's clear that parents were using these different methods of education uh, to, as they acknowledge the principle of bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but they use different methods. Um, but suppose there's a huge disparity of outcomes. Suppose 40% of the kids don't make it uh, through public school with their faith intact. And 70% of the kids who are, go through private school retain their faith. And let's say 75 who homeschool. But now what? Okay. That we don't speak to at all. We leave those things to the consciences uh, of people. Is it right or wrong to celebrate Halloween? Okay. You may have a problem with Halloween. If so, you know, don't, don't violate your conscience. I'm going trick-or-treating. You don't violate my conscience, you know. Uh, Paul says, those of you who think that you shouldn't uh, eat meat, that you should just eat vegetables, nobody should force them to eat meat. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't bind one another's consciences. So a lot This is the category of, that's called adiaphora, things indifferent, things that the Bible might indicate which is the right answer. Like Paul says, the weaker brother eats only vegetables. So Paul has the right answer, um, but he it's not imposed on your brother. It's its a thing. It's something that's a matter of indifference, and we ought not to squabble about something like that. So good. A lot of times when it comes to these, these larger issues um, outside of the, the church, sometimes there are going to be really clear and definitive things that are being said. But one of the things that you will notice is that those things almost never, and indeed I have never seen in any history uh, of, of uh, the Christian church, where those things just happen to line up with some existing faction out there. Instead, it puts you sometimes uh, at odds with these people and sometimes at odds with these people. Why? Because you're not 
having your convictions and your principles changed and morphed by whatever that group, whatever group you belong to, wants at the time. Now, this might be really good, might be really bad, depending on what he's talking about. We know how to do it. So a lot of this is with some things, it's not so much where people end up as how they get there. So for instance, um, I might be in a church and you have someone who comes up and says, I'm on the city council. James 127 says uh, to care for widows and orphans in their distress. We've got a lot of single moms in our community. They cannot uh, afford to raise their, their children. And so I want to raise the minimum wage uh, in our town because I care for those, uh, those uh, mothers and children in their distress. Somebody else comes up and... So somebody comes up to Russell Moore and says, I'm a burglar and there are a lot of widows and orphans in our community. And James 127 says we're to care for them. So hand me your wallet. <laughs> How about that? It says, James 127, I'm really burdened for these single moms. And I'm afraid if we raise the minimum wage that the businesses here in our community are going to cut back hours and those moms aren't going to be able to feed their kids. That's a great summary of the argument against minimum wage laws. Good job. I'm not going to adjudicate between those two. But why not? <laughs> Isn't it? One person says the most nutritious, the most nutritious thing I can feed my child is, um, you know, chocolate covered sugar bombs. And the other person says I'm going to the most nutritious thing is a healthy, balanced diet. Um, and this one person has had three kids die on them. Um, you know, at some point, shouldn't we say something? All right. It is his second summary of the argument against minimum wage it was a very good summary. And it's objectively true. All right. That, that harms um, widows and orphans. Uh, and the first argument that said, uh, I'm on the city council and we should uh, do something about these widows and orphans, Lurking in the background was the assumption of the burglar. Let's, uh, I, I want divine authorization to go steal from someone who's having trouble making his ends meet in order to give it to someone else. That's, you don't, you don't uh, exhibit biblical generosity with other people's money. Because those two are both being shaped and formed at the conscience level by the word of God. They're just trying to figure out what's the best way to do it. And one of them is wrong. <laughs> and this is something we can know, right? The good, let's say you take the parable of the Good Samaritan, and the, and the Good Samaritan comes along, and the guy's lying all, all cockeyed in the ditch. And he starts to help him, and he wants to load him onto the donkey. But he doesn't know the first thing about first aid, and he, knows, he doesn't know that you're not supposed to move someone if they've got a broken neck. Uh, the fact that he is trying to help the person uh, in accordance with the ethic of the parable of the Good Samaritan doesn't mean that he has the craft competence to know how to help him. In the Lord's parable, uh, the Good Samaritan did really help, but there are do-gooders who don't help at all, right? And we should be able to identify who they are. And that sometimes uh, takes a long time of just sort of hashing that out. Now, if a third person comes up and says, these single mothers... They're losers and takers. Uh, you know, the, the, we, we shouldn't worry about that sort of thing. The, the poor people in our community, that's just uh, the way of sorting out the winners from the losers. That guy gets a rebuke. <laughs> that guy's not being shaped and formed by the word of God. Are there no takers? Are there no wel welfare qu uh, queens? Does no one abuse uh uh, charity. The Apostle Paul thought that they did because he, he said that some people who are not willing to work shouldn't eat. Now, I think if, someone's, if someone said uh, every person who needs help without exception is a loser and we should uh, kick them to the curb, then yeah, I agree with more that we should rebuke them. But the abuse of the system of charity is a thing. Right? And, the, and people can care about justice and care about the welfare of the downtrodden while wanting to um, uh, factor out the kind of helping that hurts. So some of these things are going to exist uh, in those categories. 
where it's we're, we're trying to figure out what is the best way to do what it is that we agree we should do. The last uh, wrap up here, he began with personal ethics where some things are slam dunk uh, issues, which is very good. You don't uh, you don't have to go along with a fellow who says, I believe the Lord is leading me to leave my wife. But he ought to have taken that same uh, level of clarity over to corporate issues where the Bible speaks with clarity, uh, where we don't have any patience, for example, with same-sex mirage. We don't say, I'm on the city council and uh, we have to use people's uh, preferred pronouns. That's just as clear in Scripture as the issue of a man leaving his wife. So there are issues in the political civic sphere, sphere that are the, there's no ambiguity about them at all. So the legalization, uh, the solemnization of same-sex unions uh, with the name of marriage, abortion on demand, the kind of horrific public policy that often passes for um, compassion in our day needs to be rebuked, and the whole church needs to speak with a unified voice on such things. So thanks for watching our content. We really appreciate it. I want to take a second to talk about my book, Angels in the Architecture, and how you can listen to the audio version for just 99 cents, which, if you round up, is a whole dollar. The modern view of the world is empty and lifeless, nothing more than a bunch of matter in motion, with life by the thousandth millionth chance emerging from chaos. The modern world, as a result, can only conceive of progress as more efficiency, more technology, more domination, greatly improved matter in motion. By way of contrast, the Christian faith presents a glorious vision for culture and a vision of the world in which truth, beauty, and goodness are built into the very molecules of the universe. Angels in the Architecture, which I wrote together with Doug Jones, the book covers such diverse topics as creeds, poetry, history, the church, feasting, and storytelling. And here comes my best imitation of a salesman. The audiobook is now available at MyCanonPlus.com. If you haven't joined Canon Plus yet, what's wrong with you? Oh, yeah, excuse me. You can get your first month for just 99 cents by using promo code DOUG99, D-O-U-G-99, all caps. My name is in there, not as an ego thing. We're just trying to help you remember it. Mm.